Um, I don't know if they have a team in his school or not. He goes to a Catholic school, so there's not a, a not a it's not a middle school, but I think they are going to have a team, but it's sort of disorganized. All right. We are live on Facebook. We are live on Facebook, and it's okay. uh, seven o'clock. So uh, give me give me one second. Dave, if you switch switch to speaker view too, that might um, help with with the min thing you mentioned a minute ago. All righty, are y'all ready to start letting people join yeah. us? All right, y'all are start seeing people enter the room. Oh. So get people um, coming in. Um, if you're coming in, feel free. If you'd like to, you can turn on your camera. That's no problem. Um, but we will just ask if you don't mind keeping your mics muted, um, but feel free to come in and, and turn on those cameras if you'd like to. Um, and I wanted to say welcome to everyone who's, who's joining in. We're super excited. Uh, I'm coming to you from Tombolo Books out here in St. Petersburg, Florida. And we are here with um, Dave. Dave, I'm sorry, I should have asked you this before, but can you uh, help me out a little bit with your last name? I want to make sure I pronounce it right. I think Dave, Nara. Have, I'm sorry. Seminara. Seminara, that's what I was gonna guess, but I wanted to make sure. Um, so Dave Seminara and Megan Fernandez, and they are here with us tonight to talk about Dave's book, Mad Traveler, which uh, I, is a super exciting um, true story, tell of wanderlust, greed, and the quest to reach the ends of the earth. And we're gonna hear a lot more about that in just a second. Um, if you haven't picked up your book, you can do that from Tom Below Books. I'll put the link to the book um, from our website in the chat in just a second. But Dave very graciously came and signed books for us. So when you order from Tom Below, you're getting a signed copy of the book. So you're gonna wanna do that. We ship across the country. So don't worry if you're not in St. Petersburg, you're more than welcome to, to order it from us and we'll ship it right to you. Um, but just a couple of little bits about our store as well. We are located in the Grand Central District of St. Petersburg. And um, we are now open, if you're in the St. Petersburg area, we're now open for um, walk-in shopping. Masks are still required, but come in and visit us. We love to see faces in the store, or at least top, top, top half of faces in the store right now. Um, so we'll be super happy to have you here. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to give a quick introduction of our two guests this evening. First, we have Dave Seminara, who is a writer, former diplomat, and pathological traveler who lives in St. Petersburg, Florida. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, BBC, the Washington Post, and dozens of other publications. He is also the author of Footsteps of Federer, a fan's pilgrimage across seven Swiss, Swiss cantons in 10 acts. Um, and our lovely in conversation um, person tonight is Megan Fernandez, uh, is a lifestyle editor for the Indianapolis Monthly Magazine and has been published in the New York Times and Sports Illustrated. She's previously worked for International Travel Magazine, Journey, and continues to cover travel throughout the Midwest with a soft spot for America's third coast along Lake Michigan. And so thank you, Dave and Megan, so much for being here with us this evening. And as the evening goes, if you have questions for either Dave or Megan, please feel free to pop those in the chat and we will get to those at the end of the, um, the interview. So Megan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and if, thank you very much for being here and thanks for asking me to do this, Dave. Um, just so kind of everyone explains why somebody from Indianapolis is here in this, in this conversation. Dave and I have known each other for over 10 years professionally. Um, he's written for Indianapolis Monthly. Uh, I, I was very lucky to, to recruit him and, and bring him into the fold and have him publish some of his pieces. So I've worked with him as an editor and I'm also just a great fan of his work. Um, he's, you really have a natural gift uh, for, especially for getting a quote. If I could get a quote like you, like you do, I'd, I'd be a lot more successful. So I'm just really thrilled to be here and um, was very grateful to get a sneak peek at your book, which I devoured um, early. So this is, just a fascinating look into a subculture that I think a lot of people don't know exists. And, you know, you hear extreme travel, which is the subculture that this book delves into. I think people might think like, you know, bungee jumping off the Eiffel Tower, like what, it, what exactly is extreme travel? But it's a subculture that has its own podcast, its own rankings, it has a conference. Tell us about this group of people you found. 
Yeah, well, hey, first of all, thank you. I want to say thank you to a bunch of people here, first of all. Um, first, thanks to Tom Bolo Books for hosting this event. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's a wonderful bookstore in a really cool neighborhood in St. Petersburg. And as we all know, there's not enough bookstores in the world, great independent bookstores. And, you know, I wasn't invited by Jeff Bezos and Amazon to do uh, do an event, but I was invited by Tom yes. Bolo. So I really, I really appreciate them. <laughs> so if you're thinking about buying my book, I do appreciate it if you, if you support Tom Bolo. Um, so that's first of all. Second of all, um, thank you, Megan, for agreeing to to chat with me because I did some uh, some Zoom book events for my book, Footsteps of Better, and it was just me talking for 30, 40, 45 minutes or like an hour, and it was absolutely exhausting and didn't give me as many chances to to drink, you know, to drink a beer occasionally or whatever it was I was drinking. So I appreciate you doing this for me and for being a good friend and for giving me so many assignments over the years too. So thank you, Megan. And also, uh, lastly, thank you to all of you guys who are just showing up to this event tonight because I know a lot of people are getting really sick of doing zoom calls and zoom events now that things are starting to open up and getting back to normal so thank you very much for all of you for for tuning in so anyways now that i got those thank yous out of the way yeah um extreme travel and country collecting this is something that i sort of got um you know became onto my radar screen let's say about um almost about seven years ago now i started looking into who the most traveled people in the world were and I didn't know if there was actually a metric to, to find that out or not, if there were rankings. So it was sort of a bit of a surprise to me. Um, I had an idea to start a series called BBC Travel Pioneers about people who were some of the most traveled people in the world and people who were doing pioneering things in the world of travel. So I really just started searching the internet to find out you know, if there was such a thing as the world's most traveled person or the most, world's most traveled people. And I was surprised to find that there are you know, there's a number of different travel clubs where people count the number of countries or territories they've been to, but there's two in particular that actually rank travelers, and that is most traveled people, and the other group now is called Nomad Mania. So I started to, to, to delve into this entire world of extreme travel, and I found it to be absolutely fascinating. And about six or seven years ago, I started profiling some of these most world's most traveled people, and it, it led me on this path of wanting to know more about Wanderlust and to writing this book. Why is this topic um, one that interests you? I mean, I know you're a traveler. I don't think everybody here uh, on the on right. the on the Zoom understands, you know, how, why that appeals to you so much. So, can you talk about why you even paid attention to this topic? Mm -hmm. Well, the first, uh, let's say, 17 years of my life were all spent in the same house, so I didn't do any moving uh, at all between age zero and 17. But since that time, uh, since uh, leaving the house in Buffalo in 1990 to go away to college. I've been on sort of a rampage of moving from, from one place to another and also visiting many, many countries around the world. And over time, over time, you know, you do become curious about why is it that you're restless and why you feel this, uh, this need to explore and why your curiosity, my curiosity in this case, couldn't be satisfied just from Googling things or reading a book. Whereas friends of mine are perfectly content just reading a book about a place and they don't necessarily have to travel there. So it's something that I've been really curious about wanderlust for, you know, literally for decades of why is it that I, that I am sort of, a, as you, as you described me in the intro, a pathological traveler or a compulsive traveler. So I think the book started with sort of that basic curiosity of wanting to know more about why me and people like me feel the need to travel while other people can satisfy their curiosity in less expensive and easier, in easier sort of ways. So I thought I like to travel a little bit. Then I met you and I was like, okay, that's the guy who, I mean, you, you to me were an extreme traveler when I, when I met you and I realized how much you travel. Um, and then turns out that's not even the tip of the iceberg. No, oh, right. That there are these people out there who, I mean, you can't even imagine um, they've been to every country in the world. One of my favorite quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes in the book was um, that somebody, some people think there have been more people in outer space than have been to all the 193 countries in the world although it's hard to prove. Um, yeah, so, no, that's true. So yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead with your question. No, 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 that's fine. Yeah, so that's, that's it in a nutshell, is that I had no idea there was something beyond that. I really thought before I started researching in the, this book and getting to know some of the extreme travelers that I'm gonna tell you a bit about tonight and that you'll read about in the book, I thought visiting each country was sort of the, that was it, that was the finish line. If you have visited every country in the world, you're done, right? But no, you're not. That is just a starting point for really the world's elite travelers. Once you visit all 193 countries recognized by the UN, there's still lots of other things you can accomplish in the world of travel. So for example, many of these elite travelers that you guys are gonna meet in, in Mad Travelers, 
they also want to visit every province within every major country. So for example, here in the US, you got to get to all 50 states, right? Um, in Mexico, you'd have to go to all 31 states and so on and so forth. Um, and sometimes these things change, right? So because, for example, I remember one of the travelers told me a few years ago that India changed their structure. So instead of being, I forgot how many provinces there are there, but let's say that there were 30, they added a 31st, so they had to go back. So you think you're finished with the country? No, you're not, you gotta go back. And then of course, aside from the provinces, there's all these islands, which is really some, in some ways, the core of the quest of these really top travelers is getting to these incredibly remote islands that are at the ends of the earth, that's where the subtitle of the book comes from. And to get to those kind of places, you cannot go on to Travelocity or TripAdvisor and simply book your trip. You've got to find more ingenious ways to get to those truly, truly remote destinations. And that's um, sort of the crux of being an elite traveler and also getting to dangerous places and forbidden places and places that are closed, like for example, Guantanamo Bay, which is a place you have to get to if you're a super elite traveler. And you got to figure out ingenious ways to get to places like that. Yeah, and so these travel organizations like uh, uh, Nomad Mania, I think, mm -hmm. or most travel yep. places, they they keep their own lists of, they of such destinations. Is that how it works? Yeah. So, for example, you know, the three major uh, country collecting clubs are the Traveler Century Club, right, which has three hundred and some odd places to get to their finish line. Okay, and then you have Nomad Mania, which has, let's say, around. I believe it is 1,300 places to get to, right? And then you have, uh, and you have most travel people, which has nearly a thousand. So yes, just visiting all of the countries—that's child's play. Not enough. Well, um, give us an example of one of these places, like, Bouve, for instance, Bouvet Island came up a lot in your book. Yep. Yes. What, what is that? So, the brass ring. Yeah. So Bouvet Island is the holy grail of, of places to reach for for the extreme traveler. I mean, that is something. If you want to have a truly impressive destination that you have reached on, on, uh, on your travel resume, that is, the one, that is the one that really extreme country collectors want to get to. And it, it's because it is considered to be the, the most isolated uh, and most remote island in the world. And it's in the South Atlantic Ocean. And you need to spend days and days and days on a boat to get there. It's owned by Norway. No one lives there. And it's absolutely frigid and it's spectacularly difficult to reach in terms of actually not seeing it, but actually landing on it. Because of course, for extreme travelers, you can't just be on a boat looking at an island that's over there and say, oh, I visited it because I rode a boat around it. You need to actually land and step foot on that island. And this is a place with spectacularly bad weather for pretty much the whole year, tremendous winds. And, and, all, and all sorts of inclement weather. So as you, you'll read about in the book, there's extreme travelers who have tried to get there multiple times and have spent many, many thousands of dollars only to, to be able to see it from the boat, but not actually land on it. And therefore it does not count. Yeah, a couple of those journeys um, are in your book. And I think you did a great job of kind of like taking people along on that ride um, and, and feeling what it was like to, to get there so close. Um, and some of the world's top travelers are in those stories that, that you, you talk about, some of the trips to Bouvet. And I, I, I would like to, let's start meeting these people. Um, sure. My favorite, one of my favorite details in, this, in the book was this, one of the extreme travelers, this gentleman has his own jacket, custom designed with all kinds of pockets and he can put his stuff in so he doesn't have to carry a suitcase. So he basically wears his suitcase when he travels. Who is this yeah. guy? Oh, this is one of my favorite extreme, extreme travelers. This is uh, Kolya Spori, who is, I call him, he calls himself, I should say, the gentleman adventurer. <laughs> so if you want to, if you want to go to a very eccentric and offbeat blog, just go ahead and put the gentleman adventurer in, uh, in, uh, in Google and you will find this guy. He hosts um, elite travel, actually extreme travel conferences every year. And each year they really try to top themselves by going to more ridiculous, remote and dangerous places ever. Um, for example, uh, in 2017, I believe it was, they held their conference in Mogadishu. Um, and not only in Mogadishu, but at a hotel that was, that, uh, that was bombed uh, two years before. And not just a small bombing, but like absolutely leveled to the ground in 2015 hotel. They held their conference there in 2017. He's also held other conferences 
um, in, in make-believe countries. One of them is called Lieberland, which is one of these micronations that people just sort of invented that's in the middle of the Danube, a little speck of land. He held another one in, uh, in Chechnya, I believe it was. There was another one in Baghdad. There was another one that was on the ice roads of Siberia. And one of the things about the gentleman adventurer is that he, um, he does like to pack light, as you say. So his thing is he really likes to look dapper and look very good as he does here. However, he doesn't even sometimes like to bring an entire suitcase if it's a shorter trip. He tries to pack everything into like a, a very small bag, like a carry-on or whatever. And he has this special travel blazer that has many, many, many <laughs> secret pockets in it so that he can stuff a lot of his belongings in there and be able to travel uh, even lighter. But he also does have, he travels light. However, he does also have like flak jackets and bulletproof vests and things of that nature because dangerous going to so-called dangerous places is one of his specialties although he will insist to you that places like Mogadishu and Chechnya and Baghdad are perfectly safe and it's all the crazy media who tries to mm -hmm. tell people that places are dangerous but in fact he thinks the entire world is safe Syria no problem Baghdad no problem let's go pack your bags <laughs> Um, what does he do I mean who is this guy does he have a job where's he from did you did you mention that yeah yeah, I did. I believe I did mention this in the book. So Kolya, uh, he lives in, he spends time in uh, Monte Carlo mm -hmm. and also in Germany. And he promotes uh, Formula One racing and he promotes boxing and other uh, sports. Okay. Who else do you yeah. have here to introduce us to? Yeah, so we could show you, uh, that gets into some of the places. So we were just talking about Bouvet Island. We could go here, but this is just sort of a look at, this is the boat that the travelers took to Bouvet Island. Um, on an infamous expedition, which I'm sure we'll get into later in, uh, I believe it was 2015, but that's a little bit about what Bouvet Island looks like, but we could show you a few others here. This is, a, uh, this is a, uh, an individual, I'm just gonna refer to him as Frank, and this is his partner, Teo. He is also uh, one of the top travelers in the world. And I, he, according to himself, he is the um, uh, best traveled person in the world. He said he's not the most traveled person, but he calls himself the best traveled mm. because he says that he specializes in quality travel. And he developed a, a, his own list of 10,000 world highlights. Now we talked before about reaching the end of one list or the other list, those lists have, you know, a thousand places or 900 places. Well, Frank has a list of 10,000 places that one must visit in the world in order to, con to consider yourself a world traveler. And he visited 9,700 of them, I believe it was, mm. over a 10-year 10, 10 period when Frank and Teo put their things and belongings. Wow. Um, so Frank and Teo are some of them. Now, the gentleman on your right, I'm sure we're going to talk up what much more about later, but that is William uh, Bakeland. He is, or, or we believed, was a, um, a young billionaire from Great Britain who uh, specializes in traveling to remote and offbeat places. And the gentleman on the left, his name is uh, Dominique Laurent, and he's a Frenchman who is also one of the world's uh, top travelers. He was a retired international businessman and financial manager, and his specialty is sort of visiting very colorful and remote festivals. So, for example, um, during the pandemic last year, he was off to Pakistan to visit some, I don't remember what, what the festival was, but he went to, he specializes in that sort of thing. Um, this is a Greek gentleman named Babas Bezos, who is another one of my absolute favorite travelers. He is also, by some accounts, the world's most traveled person. He is actually a travel, um, a tour leader from Greece. And um, he also specializes in, in visiting, you know, dangerous places, remote places, although he will not admit anything is dangerous. He, he thinks everything is safe, too. Um, Babas is a super interesting guy. He's from Greece. This is an Irishman, um, David Langan. And um, David Langan is a stamp collector. And so his deal is getting to every place in the world that issues stamps and then getting to that place and then sending himself a postcard with the stamp from that place and sending that back to himself in Ireland. Now he owns a furniture business in Dublin, but he's very much into the stamps of the world. Um, he's a super interesting guy. I have a quote from him there on the screen. Can you guys read that quote or is it too small? I could read it for you if you like. Why don't you go ahead and read it? Yeah. David told me, this is one of my favorite quotes in the book. He said, travel is like dealing with drugs. He said, once you get it into your system, you have to have it. And he says, the trips are like drugs for these people. And by these people, I mean the extreme country collectors. He said, the drug, the trips are like drugs for these people. And it was like sitting down with the drug dealer who's telling you where he can take you. And he's, he's talking about William, who we'll tell you a little bit more mm -hmm. about later. But so that's him. Now, these are, these, are some, these are some other great, great travelers. These are right here on this screen. These are three of the absolute most traveled people in the world. 
undisputably. On the, um, on the left here, we have Charles Vealy, who is the founder of Most Traveled People. On the right, we have Harry Mitsidis, who is the founder of Nomad Mania. So these are the two, on the right and left, these are the two founders of the two biggest extreme travel clubs. In the very dead center, sorry, we, I, I lost that there, but in the very center, we have Don Parrish, who is, I wrote a story about him for BBC back in 2015. Don is from Chicago. And he is the most systematic and well-organized. And, and, and I think probably he's, my, I hate to say who's my favorite. It's like saying, who's your favorite child, which you can't do. But mm. Don is probably my favorite traveler um, because I've had a chance to spend so much time with him over the years and get to know him so well. Um, he has been pretty much everywhere. Don is the guy I told you about who tried getting to Bube Island twice and failed each time. And uh, you'll see what I have here about the top of the screen of Don. Don told me that his, here is his metric for a top traveler. He said, the test is for them to tell, tell me all the places that you have tried but failed to get to. And he said, the people who have the longest list of failed destinations, those are the top travelers. And um, Don has failed to get to a lot of places and he's also succeeded in getting to a lot of places, which makes him, um, which, which makes him a top traveler. But that, those are a few of the guys right there. And one thing we're all noticing pretty consistently all these people are men. Um, That's right. And all white men. Well, maybe not all white men. I, I, that might not be true. Um, with the exception of William, uh, looks like they're middle aged to later in life, which kind of gives yeah. you the impression. Like, do, are all these people besides William um, super rich? I mean, is that is that what what you need to be to be able that, to do this? That's another good question, and this brings me to a point of how I how I came to this story too. Is so like around 2015 when I started meeting a lot of these guys, I had this idea that um, I wanted to turn I wanted to turn this idea into a television show. I thought it'd be a really interesting either documentary or reality series. So I pitched this idea of bringing all these characters together for some sort of a show, and 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 make it about their quest to reach the ends of the uh, the ends of the earth and their competitive drive against each other to reach these places. And um, I sold this idea to a production company, right? And the production company pitched to the Travel Channel, the Discovery Channel, uh, National Geographic Channel, many different channels. And the response and the feedback that they all got was, these guys are the wrong demographic. And, and at the time, the gentleman you see on the screen, William, was not part of it. It was just these other guys that I'm telling you about. And the feedback that I got was that they're looking for TV shows all want diverse uh, audiences. They don't want just a bunch of guys, first of all. Do you have any women? Do you, are there any pretty women, preferably? Are there any young people? That was the feedback that they got from the, from the network. So the production company came back to me and said, don't you have some more you know, interesting people? Aren't there any women? Aren't there? So I sort of doubled back to these guys. And, um, and it led me to, this is how William Bakeland came into my life and how I tried to get this young man into the picture because they said that, Hey, there is this one guy. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of women who are at the, who who do this. However, there is this guy who's a billionaire from England, and he's only 21 at the time. He was only 21 years old, and they said you got to meet him. So I actually thought this guy William was going to resurrect my my idea and get my project sold to the Travel and Channel or Discovery Channel or Nat Geo, and, and it didn't. But uh, it it led me to a whole nother story, which which proved to be pretty interesting. Now, the thing about women is that I, I don't know how to explain that. I wish I could explain this, why um, women, I'm not gonna say women don't do this because there certainly are women co uh, country collectors and there are some women who are incredibly well-traveled and there are a lot of women who have been to every country in the world. So there definitely are women doing this. However, when you get to the very, very top of the rankings of all of these travel clubs, and I cannot answer why, maybe women are too, too intelligent or too smart to want to spend like many thousands of dollars to get to like an island where no one lives and, and it's just rocks and penguins and such. I don't know how to explain that. Maybe you have a theory, Megan. I, maybe you do. Do you? I'm going with you're too smart to All right. To, yeah, compulsively pursue and, and fail and, you know, if they fail and fail and fail to get to... Um, this rock in the in the sub Atlantic, Antarctic or whatever, and yeah, do other things with our lives. Mm -hmm. But no, that, I didn't mean to get off on that tangent. Um, but uh, but I will say though that there are some there are some uh, female characters in my book yeah. who have who have been to some incredible places and who are amazing travelers and amazing adventurers. So don't think don't think that the you know the entire book is all about men. It isn't. However, when we come into the category of these extreme country collectors, mm -hmm. those those guys do tend to be men. 
So it, yeah, it turns out William um, didn't save your uh, TV show idea, no. but you found an even better idea. Um, so I think within this subculture of extreme travelers, you already had an amazing story and all the, all the things these people have done and the crazy adventures they've had. But even within that story, you found a really wild one um, with, with scandal and uh, yeah. scoundrels. And um, so tell us a little bit about uh, this Mr. Bakeland. Yeah. So we'll come back to William here for a minute. So William did not succeed in resurrecting <laughs> resurrecting my TV show idea. Um, so what happened was I I emailed William to try to interview him both for I was hoping to get him in my BBC Travel Pioneer series. I wanted to profile him as one of the as a travel pioneer, and I wanted to get him on the show pretty desperately back in 2015. Mm -hmm. So this is six years ago now. I started corresponding with this young man. And at first he was writing back to me, we're coming back and forth. He said, sure, he'd love to be on the show and so on and so forth. So I said, this is great. I'm gonna get this guy, I'm gonna get this young billionaire who's been everywhere. And he was described to me as that he was gonna become, everyone was sure that this guy right here was gonna be the world's most traveled person. So I had to have him. Um, so we went back and forth and he was very interested, but then he just started, um, I wanted to vet him for the show. I had to interview him on the phone and that's where the cold, that's where the trail went cold. He was willing to correspond with me in writing, but for whatever reason, he did not want to talk to me on the phone and he broke numerous appointments and then he just disappeared. Um, and I, I, I doubled back to my guys, the extreme travelers. I said, what happened to William? This guy just disappeared. He was gonna be on my show and then he crapped out on me. And uh, they said, well, you know, he's a billionaire and he likes to keep a low profile. So he probably doesn't wanna be on TV because he really is a very private person. He likes to protect his privacy. And I thought, huh, well, okay. I guess I sort of, it seemed a little suspicious, but I, I thought maybe, maybe it's true. You know, maybe this guy just is really private. He doesn't want to be on my show. My feelings were slightly hurt. The show didn't get sold. Life went on until about three years later, all of a sudden I got an email one day, the subject line of which said, apocalypse now, a bomb in our travel community. I thought, what on earth is this? And I clicked into it and I found out that everything all of us thought we knew about this gentleman on your screen right now was not true, including his name, the amount of money he had, where he had been, where he had not been, everything about him that we thought we knew was not true. And so you, when you read the book, you'll, you'll find out how all of this story came unraveled and how his identity uh, he came unraveled, but let's just say for the sake of argument right now, uh, he was not a billionaire, not by a long shot. And I, you know, in the book, you'll see that I go to England where he's from. I went to his neighborhood and um, I sort of walked in his footsteps to find out who he really was. And he is quite a working class uh, young man from England. Let's put it that way. Very far from being a billionaire. So he was posing as an heir to um, a, a very wealthy family um, aristocratic um, English, English or Irish family. Um, English, correct. But he did actually have travel experience. He did actually go to some of these places. I mean, he seems like he um, embellished significantly. <laughs> but, he, but he also had, I mean, some of it he did, he did do because some of these travelers did meet with him. They did travel with him and they did go to places with him. And he also had a unique role within the travel community, not just a traveler, he was a travel organizer. So can you oh, tell correct. a little bit about what service he was providing? Um, oh, yes. So as I said before, earlier on, once you really try to get to the Bouvet Islands of the world, you are not going on to TripAdvisor and Expedia to book a trip there, right? So you need someone who can open up these places for you, who can figure out these lost frontiers and how to get to them. And so this guy you're looking at right here, William Bakeland, he was the man. He was the extreme travel guru. He was the rock star of the extreme travel world, I think I called him, because he was figuring out ingenious ways to get the world's top travelers to the places they never thought they'd be able to get to. These specks on the map, these closed places, these forbidden places. This, this young man, this ingenious young man, was figuring out ways to get people places, and he was doing so successfully and legitimately. And and what and when the, when you said it, you made an important point, too. I said before, everything that people thought they knew about him was not true. I actually misspoke there because there was one thing about him that was absolutely authentic and legitimate. And that was this young man's wanderlust and his knowledge of geography and his knowledge of the world's most remote places was, and his desire to go there himself was absolutely authentic, at least as far as I have been able to ascertain. 
that is the one thing about him that was absolutely true is that he's he's a, a compulsive addicted traveler just like the rest of us and one with an extreme amount of knowledge and experience so he was finding ingenious ways to get these people to places they never thought they could go to and as people have said that he was literally expanding the map for people and you know you'll read more about how he was doing that in the book but um, until he was uh, exposed as not being the millionaire that everybody thought, this guy was was the man for extreme travelers. He really was quite a hero. So he did or he did organize some trips to some places, and yep. um, he would take like some of these people we've met, Harry and Mitsidis, I believe, um, Dominique. They did book trips with him, and he he'd have to invite them to go, and then they would give him money. And some of these trips that did actually happen, but then a lot of them maybe look like didn't happen. Is that when the trouble began? It is when the trouble began, when the trips started being canceled. He pulled off a number of just incredible and ingenious trips. I mean, just as one sort of small example, there's an island called Marion Island. Now, if you have ever, if anybody here in the room, when we get into the Q&A later in the chat, if anybody has been to Marion Island in this chat room, I know you're probably already in my book, um, or if you even have heard of Marion Island, or if you know a damn thing about it, then you are a very impressive traveler. But Marion Island is an island south of Cape Town, several days that you can only get to by boat. It's owned by South Africa. This guy figured out that the South African military had a weather station there and that they occasionally, once in a blue moon, would send military And at this weather station, figure out that the South African military made these occasional expeditions to Marion Island. But he figured out a way to get a bunch of these guys who wanted to go there on that boat with the South African military. So, I mean, you want to talk about ingenious. And he did this not just by his smarts, but the way he presented himself to all of the travelers was that it was through his extent, his family's extensive uh, connections, their diplomatic connections, and so on, and their philanthropic connections, because everybody thought. Here's this incredible billionaire with billions of dollars and his family is donating money here, there and everywhere. So this guy's got connections that none of us could ever hope to have. And meanwhile, he is actually a, um, a guy from a working class area of Birmingham, which is the second largest city in England. And um, believe me when I tell you he had no connections at all. He grew up in a what is called in England a council estate, which is what we would call public housing here in the US. Um, yeah, and so he, 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 he pulled this long con, basically, um, to further, it looks like maybe to further his own, to pay for his own travels. Um, yes. And just, you know, he was unlocking. And because, and because he genuinely wanted to get to these places all right. by himself as well. And he figured out a way, a way to have other people do that for, you know, help him do that. Um, but you know, he was, as you said, expanding the map for a lot of the, a lot of these travelers and getting them to the places that they they didn't couldn't really get them to themselves. But is there another reason they were so enamored with him? Oh, I think so. There's a number of reasons. I mean, uh, you know, in the book early on, I described some of the adjectives that were used to describe William and people. The adjectives, I people, the way people described him to me, they said he's brilliant. He's a genius. He's charming. Um, they loved the fact that he had this very sort of upper crust, aristocratic, almost uh, British accent, and he claimed to have a uh, noble aristocratic lineage as well, too. Um, and he was incredibly knowledgeable. And listen, if you, can, if you can walk the walk and talk the walk with this group of guys who has been everywhere, if you can stump them naming islands in Micronesia they've never heard of, and you're 21, 22, 23 years old when, when all, all the rest of the people are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Oh, believe me, he cut quite a figure. Let's put it that way. I mean, on some of these journeys that he went on with these guys, he might have been the youngest person there by 30 years. So mm -hmm. they were all, I mean, almost all of these guys were completely smitten with him. And as I said, you know, the quote that I gave from David Langan from Ireland, you know, that I was that he was referring to him when he called him a drug dealer. He said that that William was like a drug dealer because travel for these guys is like a drug, and he they would be sitting down with their drug dealer William, who would be telling them where he could take them, right. and uh, so yeah, William was essentially like their their drug dealer, and they they fell they fell in love with him. A lot of them, right. the German traveler who I showed you before, Frank. Um, let's go back to him for a second. Frank uh, told me that that William was literally like a son to him. He considered William to be like the son that he never had. So the relationship. Um, between William and some of these guys was incredibly close. 
and is and is still close for some of them. And in other yeah. cases, the relationships are completely ruptured. You'll find. Were out there that, some red that. flags that you knew of that, looking back, um, <laughs> it's just it's pretty hard to believe that he convinced people um, of of this totally different identity. But you know, it's people all over the world, and so you know, they weren't in his, they weren't in his backyard. Um, he fooled them. But were yeah. there some red flags looking back? Oh, absolutely. Um, when you look back at it now, now William, other than I should say to the William, I feel very flattered that William is, I'm the only uh, writer that William has spoken to or a member of the media that William has spoken to. And oh, so really? there's been art articles who have been written about William. He mm -hmm. hasn't participated in any of them. Uh, HBO came out with a film. Some of you guys might've seen it. You should see it. It's very entertaining. William wanted $2 million to participate in that. So he didn't, but for some reason, William has liked some of my writing over the years and decided that he was going to participate with me and nobody else. Um, but, uh, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just totally losing my train of thought. I went yeah, off. I wonder if there were any red flags. Like, oh, the red have... flag. Sorry. Right. Yeah. So the red flag. So, but what I was going to say is William did grant one interview back before his, back before his, uh, this scandal sort of broke. And that was to a podcast, a wonderful podcast, which I actually just did an interview with Rick Azarian. The podcast is called Counting Countries. So if you look back and listen to that interview that William did with, with Counting Countries, and I didn't hear it at the time that went on, but when you listen to it now, automatically, uh, at least to me, now you can say all, uh, some of this stuff he's talking about is absolute and complete bullshit. I mean, it really, you listen to it now and you think, okay, someone should have heard that and been like, this does not sound right. Like, I'll just give you, you know, an example. Uh, he talked about as a child, now imagine a child growing up, even one who has, you know, billions at their disposal. He said that every year, they traveled to, for example, um, the same five-star hotel in Hawaii and, and, had, and had their annual vacations there and such. And so that, this is not something even wealthy English people do. You, you do not go to Hawaii. You do not go to Hawaii and stay at a five-star hotel every year with your family, even if you are a wealthy British aristocrat. He also said that he was learning, I believe it was harpsichord, and that after his harpsichord player moved back to Prague, that he was commuting back between England and Prague to take his harpsichord lessons and such. He said that he was writing a book about Norwegian Antarctica. Yeah, I mean, there were a number of things looking back. Outlandish, people, right. Uh, there, were, there, were, there, were, there, were, there were incredibly outlandish claims. And as there, there was a Christmas card he sent out to extreme travelers, I believe it was in 2017. Um, and you look back on that Christmas card now, the Christmas card had a 93 photo slideshow, I believe it was. Um, that was absolutely outrageous, and all, many of the claims in this Christmas Christmas card, in retrospect, were 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 wildly wildly improbable. But he was just such a compelling character, and he was so authentically knowledgeable that um, his story his story went unchecked for a number of years. So other than lie, what did he do wrong? Uh, you, well, you'll you'll you'll. <laughs> You'll find out a lot about what he did wrong in the book, but okay. I will say so it goes that I will say exactly. that I, I, I will say that there is almost one million dollars worth of trips, uh, trip deposits that were taken by William mm -hmm. of the of the top travelers that were never refunded, and in in those trips uh, were, were never materialized. Okay. So you're talking about somewhere between, and I should say too that you know I should make it make a caveat here too that William to date although he's still being investigated, has not been convicted of any crimes yet. I want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. So in the eyes of international law, he has committed no crimes uh, as of yet that have been proven. Um, he denies he denies the claims uh, of these travelers that they, they owe him money. But I've seen all the documents. He, he does owe people a lot of money. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars here. Um, yeah, so... <clears throat> It's not uncommon for some of these kind of trips to be canceled, right? Correct. However, usually you try again or you give people their money back. Mm -hmm. But oh, absolutely. I mean, there are there are many trips, you know, as I said, with you know, Don, we talked about Don Parrish earlier in the, in the discussion mm -hmm. and, and failed trips. So absolutely, there are trips that fail. And, um, you know, there are places that they tried to go to. For example, I think there's a place called the Scarborough Shoal, which I, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm forgetting where the heck that even is. Someone in the chat can probably pop in and, and remind me or Google it for me. But William organized one expedition where they were actually, they were apprehended by the Chinese Navy and they were sent back. So that was absolutely a failed trip. But I'll tell you what, the guys, uh, they liked that trip, even though they didn't get to Scarborough Shoal, mm -hmm. they were impressed. They, they almost got to Scarborough Shoal 
and they were they had a an apprehension. They were apprehended by the Chinese Navy. A lot of them thought that was actually kind of cool. I mean, yeah, exactly. It's kind of as a story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, one of the trips I think that did not go off was a was going to be the first of its kind um, in in the in the ever. The, it was a circumnavigation of the Southern Oceans. You talk a lot about that one, um, and yeah. one person even had an interesting ex explanation for why he was glad that didn't that trip didn't yeah. happen. And that's actually the guy we're looking at right now by coincidence. Okay. We're talking about Frank Frank the German here, and Frank told me something really interesting. You know, he lost. Off the top of my head, I'm going to say it was somewhere between 60 and 70,000 euros worth of deposits for this grand circumnavigation that was going to go from Cape Town to Cape Town all along the southern ocean of the, of the uh, globe. So get that out and you'll see how hellish that trip would have been. And Frank, you know, he told me that while he was extremely disappointed, you know, in this betrayal that William turned out to be a fraud and that he lost his money, he said that on the other hand, he was also a little relieved that he actually didn't have to take the trip. And I said, well, what do you mean you were relieved? I mean, you wanted to go on the trip. No one put a gun to your head. You sent William the money to go on this trip. And he said, yeah, because he said, when the trip was available, I felt like I had to do it because it would have brought me to a new level of achievement in the extreme travel community. But he said, once the trip was no longer available, I could sort of breathe a sigh of relief that, wow, I guess I don't have to take that. Because he said, I knew the trip would have been living hell. It would have been four months of absolute hell in very rough seas and waters. And I thought, there's a good explanation of wanderlust right there. It's like you feel compelled to take this trip that you know is going to suck, that it's going to be awful, but yeah. you're taking it because you just want to want to do it. You want to get to Bouvet Island. You want to get to these islands. So I would just say too, because I know we're getting you know a little bit late, and we're going to start in with a question soon. I just want to say you know sort of one more thing. I don't know if those will come up with the questions, but um, you know we've talked so much about these extreme travelers that the book is about. It's not just about William Bacon. Um, you will also learn a lot about sort of the psychology of travel. You will learn a lot about wanderlust. I myself, you know, as I said, I started this project wanting to know more about, about why I have so much wanderlust. So you'll find out in the book, for example, that I took a DNA test in order to find out if I have the so-called uh, wanderlust gene, um, which is, uh, I'm going to call that 7R for short, but National Geographic wrote about that several years ago. And that was one of the other sparks that made me want to write this book is to find out sort of the origins of wanderlust. So aside from, you know, this incredible tale of William Bakelin and the country, uh, the country collectors, which takes up, let's say, half or so of the book, you're also going to really learn a lot about sort of the history of travel and the psychology of travel and where wanderlust comes from and why some of us have it and why some of us don't have it. And I even have a chapter dedicated to people who hate travel in the book. So even you're actually also going to meet people in the book who absolutely hate travel and find out why they hate it. And so, um, you know, yeah, so I think they, it was really interesting to me that, you know, this, this story is all about a quest and a certain kind of quest for for the certain group of people. But your quest seemed to be to answer this question of um, get to the roots of your own wanderlust, um, which can be problematic for some people. Um, it's not just, it's not the fairy tale that, that, uh, it's made to be in the media, like, you know, van lifing. And right now, you know, right. It's, it's a fantasy that it's something to aspire to. People want to quit their jobs yes. and go on the road. And, but uh, you found out some really interesting things about how that hasn't always been seen as, um, you know, a great thing by society. Can you talk yeah, a little bit about that? Yeah, I want to just talk about that for a minute or two, because I know we're, I want to let people ask questions and it's getting almost towards eight o'clock, but I will just tell, you'll find some interesting stuff that you'll be really surprised by in my research about wanderlust. And that's because these days, you know, we really think of curiosity and wanderlust as overwhelmingly good things. And I think they are for the most part. I'm not saying wanderlust is bad. It certainly brought me to a lot of interesting places. And I think curiosity is also good. But I think one thing you'll, you'll find surprising about the book is that this hasn't always been the case. Um, if you look at studies that were, you know, that were done 50, 100, 200 years ago, and even, even further ago, curiosity even and wanderlust were actually seen as potentially detrimental things. And that's where the title of the book comes from, too, is that there was a disease or a pathology that was called mad traveler's disorder, where, where shrinks were actually diagnosing people as mad travelers. And this was seen as a bad thing, a pathology, because it was preventing people um, from having settled lives, from having normal jobs, from having normal families and relationships. And it was, it was seen as something that was also causing things like truancy in schools, for example. And it was causing people to become hobos and be running around on train cars and such. So it's interesting, as modern travel industry has evolved, 
and we've resold and repackaged Curiosity and Wanderlust as a 100, percent you know, awesome and 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 powerful and wonderful thing. Um, any suggestion that you know that Wanderlust can be detrimental in some ways has fallen by the wayside. But you'll see some of the early studies in the book that were done a long time ago. Uh, Wanderlust was actually seen as sort of a dangerous thing. Especially That's if you true. meet William Bakeland, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> So we do have uh, we do have some questions. Do you want to um, do you want to start getting to those? Some people have. Yeah, yeah, forward. let's do that. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. I'll, I'll read them to you if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thomas Landry, who's here, I would like to um, would like to know if you can relate your experiences in Malta. He wants to hear this. He must know something about your trips to Malta in the past or your experiences with Malta. Oh yeah, Malta, Malta. So I don't have anything about Malta in this book, Tom. Thank you for coming, by the way. Um, but in my first book, book, Bed, Breakfast, and Drunken Threats, I do recount a really cool story about Malta. Now, a lot of country collectors just go to Malta just to say that, hey, I've been to Malta, check it off as, as a country to have visited. I have a personal story of Malta is that uh, when I was in eighth grade in Buffalo growing up, I was, was it seventh or eighth grade? I was assigned Malta as my country in our Model UN. And I had to supposedly dress up um, like a person from Malta and I had no idea what that was supposed to be like. So I sort of just ad-libbed and I dressed up like Muammar Gaddafi and I ended up creating a, a tremendous international incident. And I got a scathing letter from the personal secretary of the prime minister of Malta at the time. This is 1986, I believe. And so when I visited uh, several years ago, I set out to find the guy, uh, this reti he retired Maltese diplomat who was a diplomat at the time. I set out to find him on my one day that I had in Malta. And I did not succeed, but I, I ended up becoming friends with him is that he, a, a Maltese newspaper wrote a story about me um, in my quest to find him. He read the story and he contacted me through my website. And um, his name is Mario Cacciatolo. And Mario and I be, actually became good friends, I will say. We started exchanging emails with each other. We ended up exchanging dozens of emails and becoming friends. And it was really sad that he died about a year or two ago. But oh, I'm sorry, I, do sorry. Have, I do have a great friend. I did have a great friend in Malta. Thank you, Tom, and thanks for coming. <laughs> um, see, you may not be the most well-traveled man, you know, as far as country collectors and passport stamps, but you get to do, you, you have those kind of things. You make those kind of things happen. And I just think that's, you have a gift for that. Um, Thomas also wants to know if there was anything interesting about Tristan de, Cun Tristan de Cunha. Tristan de Cunha. That right? Yeah, that's another interesting place that travelers want to get to. Tristan de Cunha has like about 300 people living there. It's part of the British uh, Empire. And so it's part of the, the crown. Um, that is one of the places the extreme travelers were trying to get to in this, uh, in this grand circumnavigation. I'm sorry, not the grand circumnavigation trip, but on the 2015 expedition to uh, Bouvet Island. Um, mm -hmm. Tristan de Cunha was actually one of the stops, but the guys weren't allowed to get off of the boat. There's 300 people who live there. And somebody on the island, I think, had a flu or had some sort of an illness. Um, so they, they didn't end up going to Tristan de Cunha, but supposedly like if you Google the Tristan de Cunha accent, they supposedly people in Tristan de Cunha have a very, very interesting accent. And that's actually one Island that you can get to, like, it, it's not that, that difficult to get to in the, in the, in the scale of things. So if you want to sort of just get your feet wet with going to places that the extreme travelers like to go to Tristan de Cunha actually has, it has an organized ferry service. It doesn't run often. And it takes, I forget how many days, it takes many, many days to get there by ferry from Cape Town, but you can actually go there. Like you can go online, you can book a ticket there and it's one of the places you can get to. You don't need a William Bakeland. You don't need that kind of connections to get to Tristan de Cunha. But yeah, that's one of the places at the ends of the earth that, um, that is, and I'm sorry too, that does have a distinction too. So Bouvet Island is the world's most um, remote island that's a uh, period, but Tristan de Cunha is the most world's most remote inhabited island that people actually live on. So, and you can go there too. Tristan de Cunha, the gateway drug to, to ah, right. extreme exactly. travel. Um, De Deirdre Carney is, is very hooked. She doesn't have a question, but she wants to know she's very hooked on all this, um, uh, likes what she's hearing. And, but uh, Gianna um, wants to know if you had any moments of, of doubting William's true identity in your initial reactions, or did you, did you get it? hook line did you take it hook line and sinker as well i don't know if i took it hook line and sinker i'll tell you that um initially i did accept what these guys were telling me because i trusted them so well like when someone refers you who you sort of trust implicitly i didn't think that um the, the don parishes and the um you know and the other extreme travelers of the world could be duped because i thought these guys are too smart 
So when they told me there's this incredible billionaire who's been everywhere and so on and so forth, I thought, well, these guys are legitimate. So I, at first I did not doubt him at all when I was trying to get him in my series. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but then when he was canceling all the appointments, I did get suspicious of him because I thought, who, who has the, you know, who doesn't want to be, because these days almost everybody wants to be on TV, right? I mean, it'd be kind of a cool thing, wouldn't it? So I did get a little suspicious of him and I wondered why he kept breaking the appointments and why he didn't want to be interviewed with me. But I, there was nothing that I was really going to do about it at that point. I wasn't so suspicious that I thought, wow, this guy's name isn't even real. He's not a billionaire. I, well, let's put it that way. I wasn't suspicious enough to actually do anything about it. Let's put it that way. And thank mm -hmm. you for, for coming, Gianna. And thank you for your question. She actually has another one. Um, in a world where most people, to a degree, fabricate or censor their online identities, do you think that he would have been successful as an extreme travel organizer if he had left out the billionaire detail going off as just, just his logistical knowledge? Like, why did he even need that, that story? That's a good question. Why did he need the front? Well, um, I think that it, I think that in some way, in some ways it helped him because it burnished the idea that he wasn't doing this. It wasn't a for-profit business that he was involved in. Cause if you're a billionaire or if you're fabul fabulously wealthy, no one is going to suspect that, for example, like with Palmyra Atoll, this is another place that William was taking these folks in the Pacific ocean. Uh, William used his contacts to get them there. And he told them that they had to give a $10,000 donation each to this nature conservancy, which, which manages this atoll. And um, who would ever suspect that he was pocketing that $10,000 donation because he's a billionaire. Why would he do that, right? So if he was just an ordinary geography you know, nerd who just knew a lot about geography, um, wouldn't it be, wouldn't you be maybe a little $10,000 donation to get somewhere, right? So yeah. I think that the billionaire, um, cover story was effective in that way. But I also think too, that it's, you know, it's important. I should point out, you'll, you'll find out this in the book too, that um, he didn't have to actually tell very many people he was a quote unquote billionaire. And in fact, he denies that he told people that he actually told people that. And so what happened was that there was a guy that um, sort of spread the word for him. And, and sort of, this is such a small and insular sort of community of country collectors. Everybody knows everybody else. So if one person gets the impression that you are a billionaire or you tell one person that you're a billionaire, the entire community has heard that you're a billionaire. So it's not like William was going around and handing out a business card to everyone saying, I am a billionaire. He didn't have to. Um, right, but he also does take it beyond that. He, he elaborated on that with this made up family and this made up family pedigree and history. He did, he did sell it. He, he maybe was smart about it, but. He's, yeah, he certainly did. He did. Um, uh, Kel Kelsey wanted had a question about Malta, which he thought you were, um, mm -hmm answering, but she had a little second part to it that I thought was really fascinating. And she, she wanted to know if that early experience with Malta kind of introduced you to travel or made you kind of fascinated with travel from a young boy. Did that have anything to do with why you grew up wanting to go places? Yeah, it did. It's actually a really good question. And it did, it did, it did set me on the path to travel. It really did. And I'll tell you what happened was that, so I created this international incident with Malta when I was in seventh or eighth grade. And what happened was um, the local newspaper took a picture of me in this, in this Colonel Gaddafi sort of outfit. And um, it was published in the Buffalo News, which is the newspaper in Buffalo. And um, I don't know if it was me or my school. Somehow somebody sent this press clipping or the, or the Maltese embassy somehow saw this press clipping and were furious and outraged because of course people in Malta, it's, it's part of Europe. They don't dress in Arab sort of headdress. And this was back the time in the mid eighties when, when Libya and Colonel Gaddafi were like our mortal enemies. So this was, this was a serious international incident. So my school, when they sent me this scathing letter back to my school, um, the school was totally alarmed because this was like a hostile letter from the prime minister's office of Malta. So my school was like, oh my God, this kid has created an international incident. What have we done? So they forwarded the letter to the state department. And I got a letter back like several months later from the state department. I think they sent it to the school saying, oh, don't worry about it you know, little boy, you, you really, please don't worry about it. It was from the desk officer of Malta, but they encouraged me to consider a career in diplomacy. They said, we encourage you to, um, to take the foreign service exam and to consider a career in the foreign service. And I, at that time, I didn't even know what the foreign service was. It was the first time I'd heard about it. And uh, believe it or not, you know, many years later, I did actually join the foreign service um, where I got a chance to be paid for my wanderlust and live in a number of different countries. So it actually was a pretty formative experience creating an international incident with Malta. It really was. If you had never dressed up like Gaddafi, we literally may not be here right now. 
it's true. talking about this book. Yeah, um, Hannah has true. a question. Um, what does Frank, who, if, if you're still sharing the screen, he's the gentleman um, okay, on the yeah. screen um, at, the oceans, at the ocean's edge. What does Frank mean by quality travel? Because Hannah would have yeah. thought that many of these extreme travelers value quantity over quality. So what does he even mean by right. that? So I will say too that um, uh, that was one sort of misconception I had about a lot of these guys before I sort of started this project and got to know them is that I thought, okay, these are just uh, guys who are just checking boxes and they're not learning about the places they visit and and maybe they're not impressive guys. But I actually found out I, I changed my opinion about the country collectors 180 degrees after really getting to know them and researching them is that almost every one of them, they're actually very impressive travelers. They do get to know these places. And they are, I think, quality travelers. And I think that most of them are really super knowledgeable guys. However, you know, Frank, <laughs> he has metrics about what is quality. And you would have to go onto his website to find the details of it. I could hardly understand it. But what his point is, is that he has these 10,000 world highlights. And some of these places are, for example, like UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And so Frank thinks that in order to have a quote unquote, like quality visit, for example, to let's say like Indonesia, well, how can you quantify, was, was that a quality visit? Well, how many of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites did you visit in that country? How many of the other type sites did you visit and so on? So I think his idea of quality travel and quality visits revolves around not just going to the country and, you know, and being there and saying, hey, that's it, my job is done. I have stepped foot on the country, but of visiting the most important sites there and not just sites also, but for example, some of his quality metrics are also about like, for example, having quintessential experiences. So it isn't just about visiting the top 10 sites in say Malta, but it's also about having what is the most important national dish of Malta or about, you know, what is having, you know, whatever is the quintessential experience in that country. So for example, in Argentina, it could be, oh, did you dance the tango? Oh, you didn't dance the tango. Well, then you're not, you're not passing Frank's quality test. So that's, I think what he means. Do you respect this Thank kind of travel question. that the country, it is a good question. Do you respect this kind of travel that they, that these country collectors do? Yeah, as I, as I was just saying, like I, I went into the project not respecting it very much at all because my attitude coming into this was, I was more about the attitude of you know, immersive travel. So rather than, you know, if I have a month trip where I'm gonna go somewhere, usually I like to go and spend like, I might spend a month just in one country. I don't go to 10 countries in a month. That's not my, it's not really my philosophy of travel. So I had a bias against what they're doing coming into the research. But as I said, I came out of this actually really respecting these guys because this systematic travel, it forces you to consider places in the world that otherwise you would never even dream or think about. As I said, I thought I was a pretty good geography guy before I knew these guys. But then I realized, you know, they're coming out with the Marian Islands of the world and the Tristan de Cunhas and the uh, Trinidad and Martin Vazes and the Bouvets and all these places I'd never even heard of. And what I, what I realized is that the systematic nature of what they're doing forces you to consider places in the world you otherwise wouldn't have considered. So, you know, I, I know travelers and especially people who are in the travel media like myself and who write about travel, who will look down their noses at what these guys are doing. But those same people, you know, they might travel to Italy 50 times, but never go to Africa. Well, there's 54 countries in Africa, you know, these guys have been to all 54 of those. And that takes a certain amount of effort. And, and it, you really, you, you can't help but learn things when you go to every country in the world. You can't help but learn things when you go to every province of every major country. Even if you're not trying to learn things, you're gonna learn things almost by accident. So I think that I developed a respect for the systematic nature of what they're doing. Um, and, and I think that otherwise, you know, and what they would answer to me, if they answered the question, some of them would tell you, like for example, Dom Parrish, when I challenged him about that, he said, well, most people just go places randomly. They decide, where am I going to go on vacation this year? Oh, okay, let's go to Greece or let's go to Italy or they're cherry picking. I think that was the term he used. They're cherry picking the world's most popular countries. Well, he doesn't like that approach. His idea is more systematic. I'm going to go to every place. I'm going to go to every single one of them, not just the popular places. Another question comes from someone who might know you because they knew you were a Villanova WXPN radio president at one point in your life. Um, so perhaps have um, a love of music and wanted to know, um, you know, is there something that stands out about the music and all the places that you have lived and traveled to? Mm. Oh, that's a tough question. Who yeah, the heck asked that, that question? Who asked that I, question? I don't have a name. I can't, I can't reveal it. I don't even have a name. Is there something that stands about, about the music? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know because the music is obviously different everywhere you go, right? 
I will say that the last, I'll tell you about an experience with music in the last country that we went to, which was uh, Dominican Republic. We went there over Easter and um, they blast God awful reggaeton music. I don't know if people, I, I'm sorry. I don't want to offend people who like reggaeton music, but maybe I'm just too old to appreciate reggaeton music. But when you go to the Dominican Republic, you hear reggaeton music and not just at a normal volume, but like at like ear splitting volumes, you go to the beaches of the Dominican Republic and also even like the gas stations where like gas stations in the Dominican Republic are places where people sit and gather to, um, you know, to drink and stuff like that, to have cocktails and to have beers and stuff like that. And the music is like literally rattling and shaking and you sort of can't escape it anywhere. So I think that like in every country you go to, you know, the music is like, is an important part of the culture and you, you can't help but sort of, you do learn things about each country from, from the music, don't you? And, and in, in some cases, that's a really good thing. And in other cases, if you don't like that type of music, it can be negative. Well, in my reading, I've read some, some, a lot of your travel stuff. You seem to be gravitating toward hiking. You seem to like churches and cathedrals and monasteries. And do are music clubs places where you tend to seek out on, on, your, on your trips? Oh, it is. Yeah. I've written about a lot of different musical venues and places that I've gone to over the years. Okay. For example, like the one Rosine, Kentucky, which I believe I wrote about for you, didn't I? Yes, for of your course. magazine. So there's a there's a great place. Um, it's called Rosine, Kentucky. There's like 40 people or 30, 40 people who live who live there. And uh, every Friday night uh, for most of the year, they have this incredible bluegrass jam. It's where Bill Monroe, the, the father of bluegrass music, comes from. And um, this whole town and the whole region is really all about its music. The, the, the identity of that whole region is all wrapped up in bluegrass music. So yeah, there are parts of the world where I would say that the music of that place is really what it's best known for. And it's if you visit that place and do not experience the music, then why have you even gone there? And I think that like Rosine in that part of Kentucky, yeah, that was a, I love that story. <laughs> I do remember that one. Um, and by the way, Tamara Bart, music, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go there and not experience bluegrass, right? Uh, if Tamara Bart sounds familiar, that was a person who was asking about, oh, about thanks, your, Tamara. Thanks, about Tamara. your radio days. Um, and another person who seems familiar with you is named Greg. Um, wants to know um, because you love travel and tennis writing. Do you know of any extreme travel tennis pros, like somebody who um, goes around and play, plays tournaments? just to collect countries. Oh. Is there any overlap between those two passions of yours? Uh, I don't know anybody exactly like that, but I did get interviewed on the Federer book by a guy who has a tennis podcast who is trying to reach some of the world's um, you know, most interesting or remote and most beautiful tennis courts, wants to play tennis and said that he'd like to write a book about that someday. I don't know if he'll actually do it though. Well, this might, you might be this you might be the extreme tennis traveler then since you've traveled to play mm -hmm. specifically to play at Federer's courts and and um, I would love to be the first guy to do that. So <laughs> I was the first guy to write a tennis travel log. I'm the first person to write a book about Wanderlust. I would love to also be the first person to write a book about about uh, playing on obscure tennis courts. Why not? I'll be the first. I'll just keep breaking different barriers <laughs> down. Right. Uh, there's one more question, and it's also from Thomas. Um, he thinks this isn't really a question, but he thinks that William would still be a fascinating subject of, of a documentary or a dramatic feature film. But surely that guy won't talk to you anymore, right? I and mean, does he even know about the book? Oh, William. No, no, no. This is uh, the, I'm glad you asked that, actually, because William and I um, we have been corresponding for six years. And actually, since the book came out, uh, we're corresponding more than ever. I get texts from William with book recommendations, believe it or not. I mean, <laughs> William and I, even though uh, we actually have a lot in common, to be honest with you, and William, um, William and I are, are still in contact with each other. And um, yeah, no, so we are still in contact with each other. And he actually really liked the book, which was probably the most surprising thing about this entire project is that I sent the book to William and I was expecting like a letter from his lawyer or threats or whatever, because you'll, you'll read in the book that about our correspondence is that at times William was threatening me, at times he was w wishing my whole family to get, get sick of COVID. So I really thought William was gonna hate the book and was gonna have all kinds of complaints about it and was gonna sue me. But I, I, got, I, sho I was shocked, I sent him the book and he actually said that he really liked it and it caused him to, to, um, to really reflect upon his travels and to change sort of his, some of his thinking, the way he thinks about travel and wanderlust after reading my book. So I was surprised and flattered that William liked the book. One of many, many, many surprises of mad travelers. I never would have thought it would have ended up like that. It sounds like maybe you have your, your new TV show pitch of you and William studying around um, the, the world's most dangerous places, I think. 
Um, I, that wraps up the questions and that's all I have. There's so much more in the book that I hope everyone gets a chance to read. Um, Dave uh, and Kelsey, or I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome, Megan and Dave, thank you so, so much for being here. That was an incredibly fascinating conversation. I learned a lot of things that I didn't know about a lot of different places that I will probably never see as they seem a little bit dangerous, but um, I'm happy to hear about them. And uh, Dave, I just wanted to thank you again so much for um, coming by Tom Below, signing these incredible, these copies of these books, uh, Mad Travelers. We have copies in the store. Um, if you need to know more about William, I know, it's keeping me on the edge of my seat. So if you need to know more about William, pick up your copy from Tom Below Books, a signed copy. We sh again, we ship across the country. So don't worry if you're not in the St. Petersburg area, we will we'll get this book to you. And um, Megan, thank you so much for being such a wonderful um, host and, and conversationalist. And uh, Dave and Megan, thank you so much again for your time and everyone for being here. And we hope you'll be here um, from some other really exciting events we have coming up at Tom Below Books. Um, one, just to mention one, um, on Saturday, uh, June 5th, we will be talking with uh, Lori McMullen and uh, Eliza Horner about a book called uh, Among the Beautiful Beast. And it's a book about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas's um, life. Uh, and it's a little bit of a twist on um, on her story. So if you're familiar with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and you want a little bit of, dif of a different take on her story, um, Laurie McMullen's book, Among the Beautiful Beasts, is the one to look out for. And um, we will be join joining them virtually on uh, June 5th and um, at 7 p.m. So you can sign up for that on our uh, over on our uh, our website. Sorry, I'm losing my words <laughs> this evening over on our website and get a little bit more naturely naturey feel and some, some Florida travel a little bit too. So again, Megan, Dave, thank you so much. And everyone, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very much. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Tom Bolo Books. <clears throat> Bye everybody. Bye. Have a great evening. You too. Take care. Thank you guys very much.